Hi, I'm American Johnson. This is Non-Compete, and I'm in a bad mood. I'm really unhappy right now. I've had a terrible week. Uh, I was going to have a nice, fun puppet video for you today, but everything that could go wrong did go wrong. Uh, the, the neighbors are doing construction. There was a wedding over on the next street over, and they played really loud music, and it just wasn't going to happen. It wasn't in the cards. It wasn't in the stars for this weekend. So hopefully next weekend we'll have the puppet video out. We'll be launching a new puppet also. So there's a little teaser for you. And it will be voiced by Luna of Luna Oi. Uh, so there's some good news. Not everything is terrible, but you know what is terrible is some of the discourse I've been seeing on leftist Twitter lately. That's right, everybody. This video is in response to Twitter arguments I've been having. That's how that's how you know it's going to be a good bread tube video is when you talk about Twitter, Twitter feuding. I feel ridiculous. I don't want to talk about Twitter drama on my YouTube channel. I like to keep those worlds separate. In fact, I don't even like to admit that I'm in the Twitter world, but I am. And there's a, there's a lot of reasons I, I participate in Twitter. One reason is because you see a lot of trends happening there kind of early on. So uh, I, I, I was never on Twitter until recently, like past, past two or three years. I'm new to Twitter. And I, w I always avoided Twitter because it seemed like this weird cliquish world, and it is. Uh, but I did notice, you know, in the last couple of years that it is a place where things sort of break fast. You know, you can get news early there. That's why I initially started using Twitter was to get news reports because it's a really great place to find, you know, stories as they're breaking and get information really fast. Um, anyway. Don't use Twitter. This sounds like a commercial for Twitter now, and I don't want you to use Twitter. Twitter sucks. If you can avoid it, avoid it. I use it for like professional purposes, I guess you would say. Um, but there's generally basically no reason to be on there unless you have some kind of content you need to push out there or whatever. Anyway, why am I in a bad mood? Well, there is a trend cropping up, and I have no doubt that you'll see a lot of uh, hot take videos land in here on YouTube in the near future elaborating on this discourse and uh, it's a few different things actually it's like it's like a perfect storm of uh, bad takes being generated all at the same time and it's not one person so I know that there are people that are gonna go in the comments and they're gonna say that I'm subtweeting like this youtuber or that twitch streamer or whatever it's not one person okay and it's not and it's not like I'm mad about at the individuals I'm not mad at the individuals uh, I don't blame the individuals, and that's what we're going to talk about today, I guess. It's a systemic thing. It's a, it's a culture thing. There's a lot that, that goes into these problems, but what are the problems? Okay, I'll finally tell you. Um, we've been seeing a lot of, of people talking about uh, indigenous uh, decolonization activism, uh, and we've been seeing people talking a lot about uh, black nationalism and black separatism, and uh, and, and, you know, if you, if you think you know who I'm talking about, you probably don't, because the first people I saw talking about this were actually not even YouTubers. They were just this, this pocket of this, like, one Twitter thread I saw where there were all these people who all had, like, you know, under 500 followers, nobody big time. I don't know if this all came out in response to some one big YouTuber who talked about it. I don't know. I have no idea. I'm not really keyed in on the drama. Um, a lot of people have accused me of, like, subtweeting this person or that person, but it's really not about any one specific individual. And I haven't seen any videos of people talking about this. It's all just been Twitter BS. But anyway, uh, people, you know, almost exclusively white people have, have first off all been talking about how decolonization and land back, which are Native American and indigenous uh, ideologies, philosophies, call them whatever you want, but they're basically these ideas of um, literally, you know, uncolonizing indigenous land. And a lot of leftists, particularly white leftists, have been saying that it's uh, equivalent to ethno-statism or ethno-nationalism. And it's like this sort of like semi-fascist ideology. Okay, that's what they're saying. And then, uh, you know, there's also been a lot of hot takes flying around about black nationalism and how black nationalism is also some kind of fascistic uh, philosophy. Um, so here's the thing. I'm not, this video is not going to be me teaching you about decolonization and land back and black nationalism. That's not, that's not what I'm here to talk about today. And I'm certainly not going to pontificate on like my hot takes pertaining to these issues. I want, I want you to go and check out uh, 
the actual, you know, go to the go to the source, go to read articles that are written by indigenous people, watch videos that are made by black nationalists, uh, listen to podcasts about this stuff. Uh, don't take my word for it, but but do investigate it. And um, and that's really what the topic of today's video is, is investigation. And I think that investigation is, is so important. It's something that we need to talk about. Uh, I think it's time to take a breath and, and talk about investigation and how important it is for any political activist. You know, when we talk about politics on the left and what it takes to be a successful activist or a successful uh, organizer or leftist, we always have this sort of like tug of war between theory and praxis, right? So theory are like the ideas, the philosophy, and then praxis is like going out into the world and turning that theory into reality. And so what I always say, what I've been saying for years now is theory and praxis, it's like a dynamic between the two. Like you need both of them and they feed into each other. So like, you know, you should learn theory and like try to apply it to your praxis and then, but, but test the theory through praxis. And then your praxis will lead you to make, you know, developments in theory. One of the great things about praxis I, I found is when you're actually like organizing and trying to help push the movement forward in, in reality, it sends you running back to theory because you're like, oh, we're having this problem. Oh, well, we can't be the first people that have ever had this problem. Let's go back and look at the theory and see if we can find a solution. And if there's not a solution, you know, you, you, that's when you start to kind of push the uh, boundaries of theory and start formulating theory of your own. It's a great, it's a great thing. It's a feedback loop. It's a great thing. But I've, I've recently, just recently, through all this bad negative discourse, come to realize that really it's not a, a duality. Um, it, between you know theory and praxis, I think that we need a third leg to make this table steady. And by the way, if you've ever gone to like a, a restaurant or a bar or something, and, you, and you're at a table, or like a four-legged table, and it's wobbly, it always makes me mad because all if, if all tables were three-legged, that would you would never have a wobbly table. It's a little table uh, table rant thrown in for fun. That's a bonus rant about tables. Three-legged tables are superior to four-legged tables. Anyways. The three-legged three table of, of being a successful activist, I don't know. I'm, I'm just making this stuff up right now, actually. I, I haven't thought this through very much, but bear with me. I do believe that investigation is like a third aspect that is just as important as theory and praxis, just as fundamental, just as essential. And here's why. Because if you only have theory and praxis without investigation, you're going to be a fuck up. You're going to screw everything up and you're going to do you're going to end up eventually doing more harm than good in some situation. What do I mean when I say investigation? I'm really just talking about learning what the hell you're talking about or learning what the hell you're, you know, learning about the situation, the environment, the subject, the people that are being affected before opening your mouth or doing anything. Where did I get the word investigation? I didn't come up with this myself. Mao Zedong, the great Former anarchist, you know, I'm not like a big Maoist. I'm not a Mao Stan. I'm not a Maoist. But when Mao Zedong was right, Mao Zedong was right. And Mao wrote uh, this little ditty, this little article called Oppose Book Worship in May of 1930. I'll put a link to it in the description. You can read it if you'd like. I'm just going to read a few excerpts here. Um, really, the opening is, I think, the most powerful part. Uh, but basically, Mao says... Uh, uh, unless you have investigated a problem, you will be deprived of the right to speak on it. No investigation, no right to speak is the name of this section. That sounds pretty authoritarian, right? No investigation, no right to speak. Wow, you're going to take away my freedom of speech, Mao Zedong? What a freaking tanky authoritarian. Just listen to what Mao has to say, and then we can decide how much of a tanky Mao is in the context of this discussion. Uh, oh, <laughs> Mao even recognized it. Uh, so the very next line is, isn't that too harsh? Uh, not in the least. When you have not probed into a problem, when you have not probed into a problem, into the present facts and its past history, and know nothing of its essentials, whatever you say about it will undoubtedly be nonsense. Talking nonsense solves no problems, as everyone knows, so why is it unjust to deprive you of the right to speak? Quite a few comrades always keep their eyes shut and talk nonsense, and for a communist, that is disgraceful. How can a communist keep his eyes shut and talk nonsense? It won't do. It won't do. You must investigate. You must not talk nonsense. 
I don't care if you think Mao Zedong is a tanky. That is a hell of a paragraph. Those are some powerful words, and we need to hear them right now. Uh, I, I absolutely believe that Mao is right on the money here. And hey, I've been guilty of it myself. I've talked nonsense many, many times. In fact, for most of my life, all I did was exclusively talk nonsense. I thought I was an expert on everything, even though I knew like barely nothing about anything. So I know how to talk nonsense. I know what it's like to talk nonsense. I know what it's like to be overconfident and shoot your mouth off about something that you really haven't investigated. I try really hard now not to do that. Do I make mistakes sometimes? Yes. All, all often, and I get called out on, on a lot. Yeah, I've deleted a lot of tweets because I've mouthed off about something, and then people chimed in and said, hey, you're absolutely wrong about this. Go read this article, and I would go check it out, and they were right, I was wrong, delete the tweet. Happens on a weekly basis, I promise you. I've made videos where I put my foot in my mouth, said the wrong thing. I've had to make entire videos about videos I made where I talk nonsense because I didn't do a proper amount of investigation before speaking. I might even be saying something in this video right now that I haven't investigated enough. I hope that's not the case, but it is possible, right? We're all fallible. I'm not saying that anybody who ever makes mistakes along these lines is like a horrible person and that I'm superior to them because I do it all the time, okay? So this isn't me preaching down to you from on the hill about how I'm a big smart investigator and you're a ding dong head and you don't know what you're doing because none of us really know what we're doing, but we can try harder, right? We can all try a little harder, right? And that's what this is all about. So why is investigation so important? Why is investigation so important that I'm saying that it is just as important as theory and praxis and it should be like a triality, a triad, a tri, a tribble. Because if you do theory and praxis 100% perfect but you don't investigate, you're very likely to do more harm than good. So let's take a look at it. If you go out and do praxis without investigating first, there's a chance you can do more harm than good. A great example would be these volunteers who go off to developing countries, right? And they, you know, missionaries do this stuff all the time. They go off and they'll like build houses or whatever. They, they'll go off and try to build houses and they don't know what they're doing. They don't know how to source materials. You can find there's countless examples of this stuff. They, missionaries do this stuff all the time. They, they screw things up. They cause more harm than good. They, they make things more complicated than they have to be. They don't check with the locals first. They don't, they're not solving the problems that the locals are really concerned with. It happens all the time. People are trying to do praxis without investigation. And their theory might be great, right? Remember a while back there was an earthquake in Haiti. Uh, this, was a, this was a few years ago. And it was pretty bad. And there were a lot of activists who wanted to help out. And so, you know, they decided that they would do a direct mutual aid operation where they would you know, gather a bunch of materials, raise funds, and then send a bunch of stuff down to Haiti, okay? And that's really good theory and praxis, all right? Like, yeah, the theory behind it is, you know, we want to help out our fellow humans while they're suffering, um, and then the praxis is we want to directly offer mutual aid to these people who are suffering. But then here's the problem. They didn't do investigation on a very basic level, and they were sending like winter coats to Haiti I believe it was like very, very hot at the time. It was just completely useless. It was actually a waste of resources because, you know, they could have been doing something that would actually help the people in Haiti, but instead they were sending these shipments of winter coats to Haiti. So that was a situation where the theory wasn't really that bad. The praxis in and of itself of sending material goods to people who were suffering and in need wasn't bad, but there was no investigation, so they screwed it up, right? You could screw things up with just theory, too, if you don't do investigation properly, where we, and what happens if you, if you have all theory and no investigation into the subject you're discussing, that leads to dogmatism, okay? Dogmatism is something that I absolutely hate. It's something that we're all prone to. I slip into dogmatism sometimes, but dogmatism is when you rigidly adhere to your theoretical uh, principles without making any leeway for different circumstances or you know, the, the, the subject at hand. So this is a perfect example right now where we have a lot of these anarchists who are saying that uh, decolonization is the same as an ethnostate because they, they have this theory in their head and they have this like basic understanding of what ethno-nationalism is 
And then they learn a little teeny bit about decolonization. They'll read like one tweet or one article or something, and then they'll get way overconfident that they understand it a lot more deeply than they do. And then they say, oh, well, this is ethno-nationalism. This is a bad thing. Case closed. We know now that the decolonization movement is the same as ethno-nationalism. Now we're going to stick to our guns and not listen to anybody else talk about it. I'm an expert now. I'm an authority. I read these tweets, and now I know. Decolonization is ethnostatism. I'm going to double down on that and believe it for the rest of my life. This is the problem, especially, I don't know about the rest of the world, but I know in the USA there's a big problem with people from the USA. And I used to be like this. <laughs> I still am sometimes, where you, you learn about something for the first time, and then you think about it a little bit, and then you're like, all right, I, I have completely made up my mind about this, and I will never change it. That happens all the time, uh, and I used to. That used to be me for sure. I mean, God, if I would just learn about like any new situation, I think about it for a few seconds, and I make up my mind about my position on it, and that would be it. Boy, you would never change my mind after that. That was my life for a long time until I started to realize that every single thing that I believe is full of shit. I have a couple videos on that. Put a links links to them in the description. More engagement for the algorithm if you want to watch those. Anyway, we can't just apply our theory rigidly and dogmatically without investigating the subjects that we're trying to apply the theory to. Another great example of this would be people who talk about Vietnam, okay? And it's like, I talk about Vietnam all the time. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, I don't think that Vietnam is perfect, okay? But I do think that they do a lot of things really great. So for instance, one thing they've done really great is the way that they've dealt with the pandemic. Oh, by the way, Luna's been doing a lot of great work over at Luna Oi. If you haven't subscribed to Luna yet at Luna Oi, you're a real ding dong. Go check it out. She's doing a video right now. It's going to come out around the same time as this video. And it's going to be about uh, propaganda and a lot of propaganda, like the, the freedom of speech stuff that involves uh, Vietnam. Check it out. But anyway, people, so I, so because sometimes I say things that are like positive about Vietnam, essentially, right? And then anarchists will come in and they'll call me a tanky. Because if I say one positive thing about Vietnam, they're like, oh, well, you support the state. You support these Marxist-Leninists. You're a freaking tanky, right? And it's like, well, actually, if you really look at what I'm actually saying, and if you, have the, if you bother to engage with me about what I'm saying, the things that I admire about Vietnam have nothing to do with Marxist-Leninism or the state. They have to do with you know, certain uh, uh, I forgot the fucking word. Um, qualities. When you, when you don't investigate and when you don't engage deeply with something before you make a judgment on it, that is the way to dogmatism and, and bad faith engagement. All right. I, I think that 80%, 90% of bad faith encounters are the result of people who are unwilling to investigate. It's not just leftists either, of course. I mean, I get comments every day from people who make these bad faith comments uh, about leftism, about socialism, about anarchism, without doing even the merest investigation. So sometimes, I mean, like every day I think I get a comment from somebody who says on my how anarchism works thing where I talk about how I might you know, want to live, what, the kind of society I might want to live in. And they'll comment and they'll say, well, this doesn't sound like anarchism because you're just describing a government. And I'm like, J just do the most basic investigation into anarchism and what we actually believe. And you'll see that we're not opposed to government. We're opposed to the state. We're not opposed to self-government. We're opposed to being governed by a minority of people. I mean, you get what I'm saying. They won't do the most basic amount of investigation. And they fire off their mouth. They think they're being real smart. They think it's a gotcha. But anybody who's done the most basic amount of investigation realizes that they're talking nonsense. Please, for the love of God, investigate things before you talk about them and before you act like you're a big expert about them. I mean, we've, we, I've had a video before about the Dunning-Kruger effect and the way that people tend to vastly overestimate their own knowledge about North Korea. And the fact that really none of us know much about North Korea at all. Even the experts say that they don't really know much about North Korea and what's actually happening there. But everybody acts like they're a North Korea expert because they've watched a couple of Vice documentaries and they've listened to a couple of podcasts and they might have read an article or two and now they think that they are experts on North Korea. But really, the fact is, nobody knows what the hell's happening in North Korea. I guess the last thing I'll say about this is I want to talk a little bit about essentialism because I think that's important as well. Essentialism is, is, is something to be careful for. Uh, 
Essentialism is something to look out for. I did a video about gender and I talked about gender essentialism. I, if you want to learn more about the idea of essentialism, you can go there. But basically the idea is, you know, you, you know, some people have a certain essence based on certain attributes that they have. It's, it's, it's BS, it's not a good thing. And so I've been talking lately about how the fact that white people tend to be way overconfident when they talk about things like black nationalism and uh, decolonization and white people should like shut up and listen a little bit more before they speak about these things, right? And then a few people on Twitter, many people, not just one person, but many people, uh, accuse me of being an essentialist and saying that like white people by virtue of being white are not allowed to speak about these things. Which is ridiculous because I'm white and I'm speaking about these things, right? I mean, I might be hypocritical in that maybe I haven't done enough investigation to speak that's possible. I still have a lot more reading and learning to do about decolonization, right? I've done a lot of, I've talked to people about it. I, I mean, I've had interviews with people, with, with indigenous activists, you know, Silver Spook, um, and, and I've watched interviews with a lot of activists who are indigenous. I've, wa I've, uh, I've read some articles. I, I've uh, watched a lot of videos. You know, I've tried to investigate before speaking, right? I've done some due diligence. But I'm also not sitting here telling you that like I'm an authority on decolonization and I'm not sitting here trying to explain to you what decolonization is. I'm admitting that I've, I've done some research, I've done enough to think that it's definitely not ethno-nationalism, um, but I'm not going to sit here and like try to tell you that I know everything about it, right? But the, the problem is that I'm seeing a lot of white people that, that know just, just a little bit about it and they've, and they've generally speaking only been exposed to like secondary or tertiary sources on it. So it's like, like the one specific thread I saw, it was white people talking to each other about land back and decolonization and not a single person in that entire thread was indigenous and not a single person in that entire thread linked to any kind of, or quoted from any kind of indigenous source. And they were having this whole conversation as though they were all experts on it. And they were all just like, it, it was like there was no basis in their arguments. They weren't quoting anybody. They weren't, they weren't even specifying like which indigenous group they were talking about. They were just like lumping all indigenous activists together, all forms of decolonization and land back, which by the way, it's a very heterogeneous movement. There are like different uh, takes on decolonization and what it means, you know, even within the same groups of indigenous people sometimes. So it's a complicated thing, but they're just kind of dis distilling it down and talking about it in this very like unnuanced way and I'm just like, look, you're a bunch of white people. Why don't you go read what indigenous people actually have to say about this? And they're like, oh, you know, we're, you know, we're white people. We can talk about this. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not saying you can't talk about it. I'm just saying maybe you should investigate it further before you talk about it. Because, like, read this article. I linked to an article. And then they're like, oh, look at this white person talking about me who's suddenly a big expert in decolonization and talking and, and, and trying to teach us all about decolonization. This, look at all these white woke scolds who are trying to teach us about decolonization. It's like, you were just saying that I'm essentializing by saying that you as white people should investigate this more. And then when I link to an indigenous point of view article, you tell me that I'm a white person who is pretending to be an expert in decolonization and woke scolding. It was very frustrating. I did not enjoy any of those conversations and it happened multiple times. Fuck, I'm so frustrated talking about this stuff. Okay. My point is not that white people cannot talk about black nationalism or decolonization, okay? And my point is not that like a white person can't learn a lot about other cultures. I feel like I've learned a lot about Vietnam from living here and talking to a lot of Vietnamese people. But guess what? There are things I will probably never be able to understand as deeply as Luna does about Vietnam. That doesn't mean that every Vietnamese person is de facto an infallible expert on Vietnam, okay? Luna spends hours every day arguing with people on Facebook who are Vietnamese and who believe a bunch of anti-communist propaganda, which is like laughably false. So there are Vietnamese people who have like very wrong notions about Vietnam out there. Luna will attest to that. Um, she probably, she's working, she's editing her video right now, or I'd have her come in here and talk about that. But definitely, like Luna tells me every day about all these Vietnamese people who believe anti-communist propaganda, which is just totally spurious. In fact, that's what her video this week is all about, so go check that out. Um, so it's not like a Vietnamese person, just by virtue of being Vietnamese, is an infallible expert on Vietnam, right? Um, but Vietnamese people, by virtue of having grown up in Vietnam, do have a certain depth 
of experience and a certain amount of background knowledge that cannot be merely dismissed. It needs to be respected and weighed accordingly, okay? So my point isn't that white people can never talk about the, these issues. My point isn't that white people can never critique people of color. But my point is, I think that the, the, the bar is a little higher in terms of the amount of investigation we have to do before we open our mouths about these things. I think that's fair to say. I think also that when you have a certain amount of privilege, and yeah, I'm going to use the word privilege. I know that people get pissed off about that because now it's a word that Nazis make fun of leftists for using the word privilege. So now we're not allowed to use the word privilege anymore because Nazis make fun of us. And for some reason now we care about what Nazis think because apparently like the optics of how Nazis feel about us matters all of a sudden. But I'm going to keep using the word privilege because I think it's a perfectly fine word and it, and it, and it means something. And, you know, yeah, there are certain uh, ways in which individuals can be privileged. Right? Within a hierarchical power structure, some people are higher up in that hierarchy than others just by virtue of uh, demographics. Right? So if you have a little bit of privilege and, you're, and you are in the oppressor class of a class structure, right? so like if you're a white person and you're talking to a black person, or if you're a cis person and you're talking to a trans person, all I'm saying is tread lightly, be respectful, and engage in good faith and do a lot of investigation before you form judgments and tell people about their own oppression. It's not something we should take lightly. There's a certain amount of perspective that comes from living through oppression, okay? And it doesn't make you infallible. It doesn't make somebody an expert or an authority just by virtue of being oppressed. But I think it does give someone the right to speak and be listened to, okay? And there are people who are oppressed who are shitty people, okay? I, I'm non-binary, and I know non-binary people who are shitty people, who have shitty ideas about gender, and, about, and, they, and they make me very uncomfortable, right? Uh, I'm, I'm neurodivergent. I have mental illness, and I know mentally ill people who have really terrible takes about mental illness, and I believe they actually hurt the mentally ill community with some of the opinions that they express, right? So it's not to say that a mentally ill person is always right about mental illness. But what I am saying is, when you're talking to a mentally ill person, if you don't have mental illness yourself, just be a little bit more cognizant of that fact and that power dynamic that you have with that person. And, you know, maybe just do a little bit of listening. Maybe listen to them. You don't have to agree with them, but listen to what they have to say. And then, and it, 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 look at it this way. When I first learned about black nationalism way back in high school, and I learned about the Black Panthers, I learned about it from a white history teacher, and she told me that the Black Panthers were racist, and they were like the black version of the KKK. And I thought, wow, that's terrible. I don't like the KKK, so I sure don't like the Black Panthers, right? Come along, I get to college, I learned a little bit more about them in a, in a history class. And it's a little bit more nuanced. And I'm like, yeah, these people are not as bad as I thought they were. They're not, you know, great, but they're not as bad as my history teacher in high school told me they were. And then a few more, you know, 10 years later, I actually start reading books by Black Panthers. You know, not filtered through a textbook, not filtered through a white history professor at the University of South Carolina, not filtered through a white history teacher at Stratford High School in Goose Creek, South Carolina, no. This was a book written by a Black Panther. And you read it, and it's like, oh, the things this person is saying make way more sense than the textbook or the professor or the teacher ever did, because you're getting it straight from the source. But then maybe you might read a source on land back or decolonization. Maybe the first article you ever read about land back or decolonization sucks, and it's a bad bad take. I mean, you think, wow, this really is reactionary garbage, right? Because there are bad people in every group. Like I was just saying, there are non-binary people that suck. There are mentally ill people that suck. There are indigenous people who have bad views. There are black nationalists who have bad views, right? So investigation means getting a broad understanding of what you're, of what you're learning about, you know? Don't just read the first article you come across and then make your decision right there. I mean, think about all the shitty anarchists and communists out there on YouTube who you disagree with and who piss you off. And imagine if somebody 
who has never heard of anarchism or communism or whatever your you know, ideology of choice might happen to be, maybe imagine if the first video they ever see is somebody that you totally disagree with, somebody that you despise, who calls himself an anarchist, and then that's the, that's the only video they ever watch, they make their decision, they never engage with the anarchism ever again. I mean, imagine if, I mean, because, you know, anarcho-capitalists call themselves anarchists, right? Imagine if the only video somebody ever watched about anarchism was from an anarcho-capitalist. And then they never, they, they tune out. They're like, this is terrible, this is garbage, I'm never going to talk about, listen, engage with anarchism ever again. It's not fair, right? Things require more investigation than that, especially something as broad and diverse as indigenous decolonization philosophy or black nationalism. So I'm not saying you have to agree with me. I'm not saying you have to uh, respect and admire the principles of black nationalism. I'm not saying black nationalists are infallible or anything like that. Same goes for land back decolonization. I'm saying that I've investigated it. To me, when I see these people in, this, in these recent Twitter threads saying that land back and decolonization and black nationalism is exactly the same as ethnostatist fascism, it looks like nonsense. And I really hope that we can encourage each other to investigate more. We can challenge ourselves to investigate more before we open our mouths. Because it's like Mao Zedong said, no investigation, no right to speak. Isn't that, is that too harsh? No. Get over it, snowflakes. I'm American Johnson. This is non-compete. It's been nice chatting with you. Hope we can get that puppet show out next week. Take care of each other. See you next time. As the Japanese forces sweep across China, Mao Zedong makes a startling announcement. I am willing to join forces with Chiang Kai-shek, he says, to drive the Japanese out of the homeland. Chiang's armies are being routed by the overwhelming power of the Japanese military machine. Desperate for aid, he reluctantly accepts the communist offer. For the next eight years, an uneasy alliance will exist between the two leaders. Mao openly talks of a united front, of the possibility of coexistence and harmony between the communists and the Kuomintang. But privately, he says, the war will go on long after the Japanese are defeated. The presence of this enemy is secondary to the ultimate victory of communism. He uses the war to enlist almost a million men in his army. But each new soldier undergoes an intensive indoctrination in Mao's version of communism. You will fight to gain the spoils of war, they are told. The guns and ammunition you capture will give us the strength for final victory. And you will take these arms wherever you find them, in the hands of the Japanese or Chinese armies. Foreign journalists who meet Mao in Yan'an report that he is a philosopher, a poet, and patriot. Few realize that buried beneath this mild facade is a ruthless hunger for power and a limitless faith in his own ability to secure ultimate victory for communism. Many observers speculate that China, not the Soviet Union, poses the greatest threat to the free nations of the West.